This is Laura Quattrini. I am the Stewardship Program Manager with Rock, uh, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, and I'd like to welcome you to our presentation, um, Sagebrush Birds. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, we are formally known as Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory. Uh, for over 25 years, our mission has always been the same, and that's to conserve birds and their habitats. And we do that through uh, an, a, a full circle approach of using sound science. Uh, we achieve that through empowering people, and it's realized through stewardship and sustained through partnerships. And if you'd like to learn more about our organization, please visit birdconservancy.org. Uh, the purpose of this presentation today is simply to increase knowledge about the species of birds that live within the sagebrush ecosystem. In the recent past, a lot of focus has been on mag managing the landscape for sage grouse. And while much of the work done to benefit sage grouse likely benefits other species, we would like to better enable you to understand how these other species as can be indicators of habitat health. And knowing what relationships birds have with their habitat can allow you to use their presence or absence as a metric for um, your management goals. Uh, in addition, monitoring populations over time allows us to understand how other species of concern may be impacted by changes in the landscape. And I'm pleased to let you know that uh, this webinar is coming to you with funding from Western SARE, which is Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. That's uh, with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, also from a conservation innovation grant through Natural Resource Conservation Service and with funding from a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. I have a few housekeeping, housekeeping items to go over before I turn it over to Nick. Um, this presentation is being recorded so that we can post it to our website, uh, hopefully in a few days. Therefore, we're going to hold off answering questions during the presentation. But please feel free to uh, use the chat section to uh, just send us your questions as the presentation's going, and we'll make note of them and answer them with all allowable time at the end of the presentation. Um, again, we are going to be we are using the computer audio for this presentation because we are going to be playing some bird songs and calls. Um, if we happen to get disconnected from the audio on the computer, we're going to quickly call in using the phone line. Um, so just hold tight. And then uh, also, just to let you know, everyone except for the presenter is muted, so you won't be able we won't be able to hear you. Um, and that will just uh, get rid of any possible background noise. So. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Nick Van Lannen. He is a wildlife biologist with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies uh, with our science program. He's been with us for the past six years, leading our avian monitoring efforts in Wyoming, um, which is incorporated into our IMBCR program, which Nick will talk about. No, it's uh, integrated monitoring in bird conservation regions. Um, again, if you'd like to learn more about that, please visit our website. Um, let's see, previous to Bird Conservancy, Nick has held a number of positions working in the natural resources field, which was intermixed in receiving his Bachelor's of Wildlife Ecology degree with the University of Wisconsin-Madison and his Master's degree in Wildlife Biology from Colorado State University. So I am going to turn it over to Nick. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Um, maybe before we get going, I'll just chat, check the chat room real quick to make sure that uh, you all are hearing us okay. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Okay, I don't see it filled with, um, with lots of problems, so that's great. <laughs> Very good. Um, so yeah, as Laura mentioned, I'm just going to talk briefly about some considerations you all might want to think about as you're uh, managing sagebrush habitat for birds. 
and then we're going to get into some of the um, avian species that utilize sagebrush systems, talk about identification, and some of the habitat associations with those birds. So just real briefly, we're going to talk about some of the factors to consider in sagebrush bird management. This is probably something that many of you are already aware of, but I thought a refresher might be of some value. So species range and distribution is obviously one of the first things you want to consider, thinking about what species occur in the areas and the lands that you manage. So obviously range maps, like shown in the upper left corner, can be really useful for thinking about what time of the year species would be there and the geographic extent that they occur across. Another resource that can be used is distribution data. And I wanted to point you to one source of that, which is at our Rocky Mountain Avian Data Center. This is an avian data center that's meant to be a one-stop shop for avian data. We currently put all of our IMBCR monitoring data and make that available on that site. And you can actually run specialized queries on that avian data center. You can select state, uh, particular species if you're interested. It will show you, as you can see here, the hollow blue circles are areas where we've actually done surveys. And then I believe I selected golden eagle as a species for this filter. And then you'll see these hollow blue circles with a pink dot in there for survey locations where uh, in this case, a golden eagle was observed. So again, that can kind of tell you sort of where in your area or uh, a particular species is occurring in your county. Another thing to think about is territory size and area sensitivity. So as the landscape becomes increasingly more fragmented, the need for large patch sizes is more and more important um, and, and heightened. And so there's a couple of different uh, issues that can arise with small patch size and habitat fragmentation. And so we've got some citations here from papers that have shown an increase in nest predation, uh, largely because of increased numbers of mesocarnivores. Roadways uh, and habitat fragmentation can help facilitate movement by coyotes and that sort of thing. We also see increased numbers of ravens associated with anthropogenic structures like um, power poles, and energy development structures and things like that. And then also we can also see increased brood parasitism from brown-headed cowbirds, which can lower fecundity for a lot of these species. Obviously, real basic habitat type influences the avian community. So if you have water available uh, within the lands that you manage, you're going to get a different suite of birds than if you do not. And so again, just habitats dictating species. Like I mentioned, if you have water available, you might have an opportunity to have some American avocets around. Um, you know, yellow warblers are typically strongly tied to riparian habitat. Obviously, they're tree nesters, and so you know, you would need some sort of overstory structure as well. And then, lastly, just to kind of expand upon that, you can also think about the structural diversity of the landscape. So, getting beyond just kind of the broad habitat uh, characterization. And here's an image that I just kind of put together of uh, looking at, you've got increasing density and height of grass on the x-axis and increasing density and height of shrubs on the y-axis. So you can kind of imagine the size of the picture representing the niche that these different species might uh, occupy. And so here you've got the western meadowlark. It's pretty tolerant of shrubs, so it can handle uh, quite a bit of shrub height and cover. It likes at least some grass and then also enjoys lots of grass. Uh, in contrast, we've got the mountain plover, which has a much smaller niche. It's kind of existing in this area with sm uh, a low amount of shrubs and also a low amount of grass. So just kind of a graphical representation there. So those are just a couple of uh, kind of real basic stuff, probably things that you all are familiar with, but I thought I'd just run through that one more time. And then we'll move into some of the sagebrush bird, uh, birds that occur within sagebrush habitat and their associated habitat needs. So obviously we've got to start off with greater sage grouse. Um, I'm sure some of you have probably have some sage grouse fatigue, um, but definitely a, a key uh, species in the sagebrush system as many of you know. Um, and so just to quickly run through what I'll be doing for each of these species is uh, have an introductory slide with the range map on the right side and that lets you know uh, if the species occurs in your area. And then the next slide will be information on the population status and habitat requirements for that species. 
We'll also have the designation for the different agencies up. And then lastly, we'll get into some of the identification characteristics and run through some of the vocalizations uh, for each of the species. So greater sage grouse is a non-migratory species. It occurs throughout much of the uh, range where sagebrush is, is found. The habitat needs that make it so tricky to manage for uh, vary throughout the year. And so they tend to like sagebrush shrublands and the breeding and wintering habitat and then require soils with higher moisture, um, increased amount of herbaceous cover and forbs, and higher insect abundance for the brood rearing season. The population status, again, as many of you are aware, has uh, been shown to be declining. It has been considered warranted but precluded from listing at this time. And then in the lower right corner, you see the special designation for BLM, the state agencies. And then the PIF stands for Partners in Flight. And so it is listed as a concern and stewardship species there as well. So we've got an image here of the male on the left and a female on the right. Uh, the greater sage grouse is a very large grouse. Uh, the male is actually about the size of a turkey. The female is about 20% smaller. Um, it is can be identified with this dark belly patch here that you can see best on the female image. And then they have this mottled dark brown back. And so then we'll go ahead and uh, play it. Uh, this is a display call for the male on a lek. Uh, I think it's just kind of interesting. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting uh, the vocalization, and uh, this is yeah again from the male displaying in the lek. So you can see a very isolated um, distribution here. Um, I believe that there's also some populations that creep into Utah as well that are not shown in this range map. Um, but the habitat needs are thought to be very similar for the Gunnison sage grouse and the greater sage grouse, again, varying throughout the year, using that sagebrush shrublands for breeding in winter and then relying more on wet meadows and riparian areas that have higher insect abundance for the brood rearing season. And population status is, again, thought to be declining. They were recently just listed as a Fish and Wildlife Service threatened species and uh, are listed for BLM and Colorado State, as well as a concerned stewardship species for partners in flight. So here we've got some images, um, fairly similar in appearance to greater sage grouse. And I have to plead a little bit of ignorance here. I've actually never seen a Gunnison sage grouse, so there's probably folks on the, on the webinar that have greater familiarity than me. Um, but my understanding is that they show a little bit stronger barring in the tail with more distinct white on dark uh, modeling. And the tail feathers tend to be shorter than greater sage grouse, and they're about one third the size of the greater sage grouse. And so moving on to the call, it's uh, at least this rendition, it's a, a slightly higher pitched kind of popping noise for the male display. Okay, so moving on to another grouse species, we have the sharp-tailed grouse. And you can see this is another uh, year-round resident species uh, throughout much of the sagebrush range. They do utilize sagebrush shrublands as long as there is a somewhat substantial grass component and, and or herbaceous plants as well. Um, oftentimes, they're known to nest in alfalfa or wheat stubble. Uh, the population status for this species is also about to be declining. I, I know particularly for the Colombian sharp-tailed grouse. And you can see that it receives special designation um, from BLM, quite a few states at the BLM level, and also with the state agencies. So um, love these species that are named after some of their diagnostic characteristics. 
but the sharp-tailed grouse has a sharp-looking tail with a, a very pointed tail, as you can see in this image. They also have really pale breasts with dark spots. And again, we'll just play the vocalization, and um, I believe this is another uh, displaying vocalization. <laughs> Okay, so moving out of the grouse realm, um, I just wanted to give a really brief overview of some of the diurnal North American raptor shapes. Rap, uh, raptor shapes and silhouettes is one of the key things for kind of classifying um, and, and starting to narrow down what you're looking at and put it into a, a genus if possible. So um, the falcons are generally known for having really pointed wings. You can see here in the silhouette cartoonish silhouette here, and then they do have this sort of tapering tail image, um, obviously very fast uh, individuals, the uh, three different species that would occur within the sagebrush range. Excipiters are known for having short, broad wings and a really long tail uh, that makes them uh, have increased acceleration. They tend to occur in, in wooded areas, um, but you may see them flying over sagebrush habitats. Budios are, um, that would be probably the best known, would be the red-tailed hawk, also Swainson's hawk and ferruginous hawk fall within the, the Budio genus. Um, so longer wings, very broad, short tail, they're very much built for uh, soaring. Osprey uh, can look something like an a eagle in flight. Uh, one thing that's really nice is that they generally show this sort of M shape in the wings. And that works, that holds true if they're flying straight above you and you're looking at them from underneath. Also, if you're looking at them from straight horizontal, they also tend to have kind of an M appearance with the tips of the wings being below sort of the shoulders of the wings. Eagles, obviously very long wings, very broad, um, also built for soaring. And then lastly, we have the Northern Harrier with really skinny long wings and a long straight tail. Um, and they're known for having a very kind of buoyant uh, wing flaps. Uh, can be very distinctive. I've, I've heard folks describe that as, as it's as if they're dribbling two basketballs or a basketball with each wing. And then uh, we'll go ahead and throw a turkey vulture in. There's lots of debate amongst folks that study raptors whether vultures should be considered raptors or not. Um, but they also can uh, superficially appear like eagles. And uh, the nice thing there is that they really show a strong dihedral where they're, if you're looking at them kind of head on in flight, they, their wings make a V with the tips of the wings being up above the head and they kind of tend to flutter and, and totter back and forth in the air, um, rarely flapping their wings. So that's a brief overview and then we'll get into some of the species. Um, Ferruginous hawk is one species that um, can be found in sagebrush habitats. Uh, they are a migratory species, but can be found year-round in at least some areas with sagebrush. Uh, Colorado, we have them um, year-round uh, along the front range. They require large, ex extensive open areas um, that can be comprised of grasslands and shrublands, uh, oftentimes strongly associated with prairie dog colonies. The population status for this species is somewhat uncertain. Um, and this is based on BBS route information, um, thought to be potentially increasing. But again, I would say that this is a species um, that is potentially at risk due to habitat fragmentation and, and potentially energy development as well. And you can see that they receive a lot of special designation by BLM and state agencies. For appearances, um, these nice dark colored legs uh, it can be a really nice key diagnostic uh, characteristic for them. Um, they have this really large, chunky body. They're even a little bit larger in terms of body mass than a, a red-tailed hawk. They have a very nice, straight, leading edge of the wing, and then uh, kind of a really smooth arc in the back of the, or at the trailing edge of the wing. Um, they also display a white tail, 
which often can be seen even from viewing them from underneath. But those rusty colored lights can, can be really helpful as well. And the call, to me, it's, I always think of like a, not that I have much experience, but of like a bomb being dropped. It's kind of a falling away vocalization. So a little thinner and kind of wimpier than the classic uh, keyer call of the red-tailed hawk. Um, because we're not touching on all the different raptor species, I, I did just want to try to avoid the scenario where a little bit of information is more dangerous than no information at all. And so I did just want to point out that there are some other species that can be found in the sagebrush environment that would look somewhat similar to a ferruginous hawk. So here going from left to right, we have Ferruginous Hawk, and that's a, a dark morph. And we have a Swainson's Hawk in the middle, and a red tail Hawk immature on the right. So you can see, again, you've got this really nice, smooth trailing edge of the wing here, whereas a red tail Hawk tends to have more of a bulge, uh, kind of right where the primaries give way to the secondaries in the wing. You can see, again, this white tail, even from underneath. Uh, the Swainson's hawk are pretty easily differentiated because they're sort of the reverse of the rest of the Budios, where a lot of Budios will show this darker um, kind of leading edge of the wing and then with a lighter trailing edge of the wing. The Swainson's hawk are reversed with a lighter leading edge of the wing and darker uh, coloration um, towards the trailing edge. And then here you've got the red tail hawk. They almost always will show a pretty strong belly band streaking here. They have a dark leading edge of the wing with these wrist commas. And one thing to be aware of is that the red tail hawk immatures do not show a, a red tail. And so you want to try to avoid using that. But this um, real bulge in the kind of secondaries of the trailing edge of the wing, the dark leading edge of the wing, the wrist comma, and the belly band are all great characteristics for the red tail. Moving right along into the prairie falcon, this is a, a year-round species for most of the sagebrush habitat. They also require open areas with rocky outcroppings for nesting, so that can uh, include grasslands and shrublands. Their population status is thought to be potentially stable, and they do receive some special designation. Again, as a falcon, they have this really pointed wing with a slightly tapered tail, um, quite thick in this case as it's a large falcon. They tend to be much paler than the peregrine falcon if you were to happen to see a peregrine, uh, which could happen during migration, spring or fall, uh, through a sagebrush habitat. Um, they do show this um, dark armpits, though. That's quite uh, characteristic. And also another clue that it's a falcon is that they have this sort of runny mascara coming from the eyes. So it's another clue that you're looking at a falcon. And the call, this is uh, mostly, the only times that I've really heard this in the field is when I'm uh, fairly close to a nest. And so if you do hear this, it's, that's a good indication. And if there's rocky outcroppings, you've got a good chance that you've got a nesting pair. A couple other falcons that can be found in the area. So on the left, we have the American kestrel. Uh, again, you can see the pointed wings in this image here of it flying. Uh, the kestrel is a much smaller falcon. It's actually the smallest falcon in North America. They tend to have a really fluttery wing beat, not very strong at all. Generally speaking, they don't fly as fast. I feel like a lot of Merlin and prairie falcon sightings that I have, it's uh, the birds are really moving, whereas kestrels, they're well known for hovering behavior, where they'll kind of be fluttering and basically uh, staying still, sort of kiting, um, looking, at, I guess, as they're hunting on the wing. But a lot of times you'll see them perched on the wires of, of power lines, whereas a prairie falcon, whenever I've seen them, they're always on the wood struts of the power lines. And then uh, Merlin, too, generally will uh, not be on the wires themselves, but on the posts 
of power lines. And so you can see the Merlin on the right. In general, they look much darker because of the heavy spotting on the breast. Uh, and a lot of times you'll see the prairie race of Merlins in sagebrush habitat, but even so, uh, although that race is lighter than the, the standard or typical um, Merlin, they're a little bit more tan and less blue. They still do show quite a bit of, of spotting on the breast. Another species that can be observed is uh, golden eagle, and so another year-round resident throughout the western U.S. They like open areas, but can include grasslands and shrublands. The population status is thought to be potentially stable. They also definitely receive some special designation by BLM, state agencies, and partners in flight. So obviously a very large bird. The adults are dark overall. The juveniles will have a white band near the base of the tail, and uh, I believe it's the second year birds have white uh, spots sort of near the wrists on the underside of the wing. They will show a slight dihedral, so kind of a real shallow V um, with the wing pattern in flight, uh, not as pronounced as a turkey vulture. But the nice thing is, is an immature bald eagle could be mistaken for them, and they generally have uh, their wings are, are completely flat. So the, the slight dihedral in flight can be helpful there. Go ahead and listen to the call, and then I'll get into some of the potential lookalikes for the golden eagle as well. So kind of a, a, a wimpy call, not really befitting of such a large raptor. Uh, that's the way it works sometimes. So uh, some of the lookalikes, we have the, the golden eagle in the upper right corner here. And then on the left, we have turkey vultures. The turkey vultures um, can especially appear to be very similarly sized and from a distance just look dark as well. Um, if you watch them long enough or if they're close enough, a lot of times you can see this two-toned coloration with the kind of lighter coloration on the trailing edge of the wing and darker up front, whereas the golden eagle will look fairly uniform in terms of uh, dark coloration throughout the wing. The turkey vultures also, as I mentioned, will show this really strong dihedral, this V in the wings, and they appear to kind of totter um, as they're riding thermals. A golden eagle will just show a, a slight dihedral, kind of similar, I would say, in shape to the, the red-tailed hawk, where the wings are maybe just a little bit above horizontal. And then in the lower right corner, we have an immature bald eagle. And so here you have a little bit more white modeling throughout. Another thing uh, that I mentioned, so the, the wings are held pretty much horizontal for a bald eagle, whereas they're a little bit of a dihedral for a golden. And then lastly, the head of a bald eagle is much larger in comparison to the rest of the body. So you can kind of see that here with the golden eagle, some of it's sort of the angle of the shot. But the golden eagle head oftentimes looks much smaller. And that's another characteristic of the turkey vulture is without the, the feathers on the head, the head can look very small as well. So if you see a, a large bird with a large looking head, you're probably looking at a bald eagle, especially if the wings are held horizontal. Okay, we've got one more raptor, and that's the burrowing owl. Uh, these are a migratory species, but also found much throughout the sagebrush habitat. They like open areas. They prefer areas with short vegetation and oftentimes can be associated with prairie dog colonies. The population status is thought to be potentially stable, but they are also another species along with mountain clover that are tied to the, the prairie dog colonies and are receiving a lot of special designation by BLM, state agencies, and partners of flight. They're a diurnal owl, so it can be seen throughout the daylight hours. Um, also, sometimes just pre-dawn, they're oftentimes foraging, but they're um, some of the physical characteristics are that they have these long legs. They have they're brown with white spots on the back. They have real pale belly, with brown spots and barring. And then a uh, behavioral cue that I think is really uh, useful is that they tend to have a very undulating flight where they'll kind of dip up and down as they're flying, even close to the ground. And it's really kind of unusual and, and fairly distinct for them.
We'll go ahead and play the call. So kind of a repetitive call. Uh, one other thing is, um, so typically when I've seen them, it's either been on fence posts or basically this, these two photos uh, sum it all up. I've, I've generally seen them either on a fence post or on the mounts associated with prairie dog colonies. And then, as I mentioned, the mountain plover is another species that's associated with these prairie dog colonies, uh, migratory species, and can be found throughout uh, a fair bit of the sagebrush habitat in Montana, Wyoming, Colorado. They like open areas, so grasslands and shrublands. Um, generally speaking, if you're going to find them in sagebrush shrublands, there will be uh, an open area, with, uh, kind of an open grassy area within, could be surrounded by sagebrush. Uh, they also have an affinity for freshly plowed fields, so just completely bare dirt. Uh, but they really do like that large bare ground component, and the population status for these, the species is also thought to be potentially declining. And again, that's based on BBS, Breeding Bird Survey Route Information. For characteristics, they have kind of a unique shape, sort of this shorebird-looking shape. But um, unlike most shorebirds, they can be found in areas that don't have any water component at all. They show a pale breast and belly with a tan back. They have this black patch sort of above the eye and the forehead here, where my mouse is. And then another thing to think about is that the, the killdeer has a very similar shape, and I'll show a picture here in just a moment. First, I'll go ahead and play the call. So as I mentioned, the killdeer has a very similar shape, so they're both in the plover group. And um, you can definitely see them in the same types of habitat, so I wanted to just point that out. The nice thing is, is that killdeer have kind of an orangish tail that's very evident in flight, and then they have this double black necklace. So fairly different looking than the, the more plain mountain plover. Another shorebird is the long-billed curlew. And this is another migratory species. They usually come back starting in March or so. And again, found throughout much of the area that sagebrush is found in the western U.S. They use grasslands and short grass patches within sagebrush. The population status is somewhat unknown for this species as well. Um, I would also say that where I typically have seen long-billed curlews, at least in Wyoming and Colorado, is on um, flooded uh, flooded irrigation, alfalfa pastures, and that sort of thing. Um, but definitely, if that's surrounded by sagebrush, then uh, you can see them in that sagebrush habitat quite frequently. So they're a very large shorebird, and obviously, again, this is another one that right in the name gives you one of the features, is that they have this very long bill that's curved. Um, they're kind of a, a warm, tan, brownish color, cinnamon-colored overall, and fairly distinct. And to me, the vocalization is pretty much the quintessential shorebird, kind of makes you feel like you're at a beach or something. Okay, moving along, and now we're getting into the songbirds. There's a, a green-tailed towhee is somewhat of a habitat generalist, but definitely utilizes sagebrush environments. They're another migratory species and with a, a fairly large geographic extent to their range. So as I mentioned, they use sagebrush shrublands. They also can uh, occupy habitats probably up to about, at least in Wyoming, I see them up to about 85, maybe 8,200 feet in elevation. So they get up a little bit higher than some of the other uh, sagebrush obligates. 
and you can find them in woodlands and riparian areas as well as the sagebrush shrublands and um, see them mixed in with uh, greasewood habitat and saltbush as well. The population status is thought to be potentially increasing based on BBS information. Uh, they are receiving some special designation from at least uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, to my knowledge, and then are listed as a regional and stewardship concern species by partners in flight. They're a very large sparrow. Uh, they have a long green tail. They have this red cap, a white throat, and a fairly distinct looking. The song is, if you're familiar with a spotted towhee, it's somewhat similar. The spotted towhee tends to have very uniform and repetitive introductory notes, usually two or three introductory notes followed by a trill. The green-tailed towhee usually has more variable introductory notes followed by some sort of a trill, and then oftentimes there's a couple of extra notes at the end of the trill. And so it's really kind of the pattern of um, you know, three, four, five introductory notes followed by a short trill that I use you know, to cue in on. And I guess I don't have the vocalization for that. We can do that at the end. <clears throat> The next species is loggerhead shrike, and this is another migratory species. The one thing to be aware of is that northern shrikes will come down from Canada uh, and then winter throughout a lot of the sagebrush range. They look very similar. They have a slightly uh, wider black sort of mask that goes to the eye. They're a little bit bigger. They can show some scaling on the breast. The northern shrike can. Um, the loggerheads, I believe, leave sometime in September or um, maybe early October. And so if you're seeing something that looks like this, you know, in the winter months, then more, more likely than not, you're looking at a northern shrike. They utilize open areas with some trees and shrubs. There's Generally, they like at least a few shrubs in the area that are, you know, over a meter, meter and a half tall. Uh, definitely utilize sage for a shrubland habitat. Their population status is thought to be declining at the continent level and throughout the West, and they're receiving a lot of uh, special designation by BLM state agencies and partners in flight as well. The vocalizations uh, for these guys are pretty variable, and it's one of the I have a hard time with, honestly. A lot of times when I hear it, um, I'm, it kind of makes me just think of, you know, what the heck is that? And luckily, they typically perch in very obvious spots, either on telephone lines or um, the tops of some of the larger shrubs in the area, and so generally they're very easy to spot and pretty distinct looking. They have kind of the same coloration pattern as like a northern mockingbird, for those that are familiar with that, with kind of the gray, black, and white. They have these very distinct wing patches. Um, you can't see it as well when it's perched, but in flight they're very evident. They have this black mask, with black wings, and then they've got this hooked bill. They're one of the more feisty of the uh, passerines. Um, they'll oftentimes eat anything from grasshoppers to lizards to small songbirds, and some folks will call them butcher birds because they oftentimes will actually pin uh, their prey items on, say, barbed wire fences or thorns, and I don't know if it's exactly a territorial thing or if it's more of a, a food uh, cache behavior, uh, but regardless, that's where they get their name. It's kind of an interesting behavior. I'll go ahead and play the vocalization. As I mentioned, it's kind of repetitive, but uh, with a couple of notes, and then those series of notes will be quite variable. So they'll do two or three calls, and then switch it up and do two or three different calls. Okay, next we have the sage thrasher. This is a, another migratory species that's found um, strongly tied with sagebrush, also greasewood and uh, saltbush habitat as well. They generally will occur in sagebrush shrublands that have limited grass cover. They seem to show a preference for larger sagebrush uh, with taller shrubs. And 
kind of interesting behavioral trait is that almost always when I see them perch, they're on nearly the largest shrub in view. Um, that's really, so I hear one and like just look around the landscape for the tallest bush you can find and more often than not that is exactly where they are. Their population status is thought to be declining and so again they're receiving some special designation by lots of different agencies. They've got this gray tail, back, wings, and head. They have a pale yellow eye if you get a really nice look at it. Um, kind of the shape of them is, is very similar to uh, American Robin. They have this white belly with black spots and streaks. They have white corners to the tips of their tail, and that can be quite evident in flight. And as I mentioned, just a behavioral trait that I've noticed is that they tend to perch on the very largest available shrub. The song for these guys is a very long song. It just kind of goes on and on. To me, it reminds me of, I don't know, it makes me think that they're like talking to themselves and can't get enough of their own voice. Another sagebrush obligate species is the brewer sparrow, and I had to use a little different range map here, um, but you, you can again see that the green is the summer breeding location, uh, yellow is where they can be found in migration, and the, the gray is where they winter, so another migratory species that's found throughout much of the sagebrush habitat. They like sagebrush shrublands, you can also find them in greasewood and saltbush as well. Population status for the species is thought to be uh, declining. And again, this is another species that a lot of folks are starting to um, be concerned with. So they're kind of tricky in that they are the sort of the quintessential little brown job um, bird species out in the, in the sagebrush. They're a pale, small sparrow with a really uh, long tail. They have an unmarked gray breast, which is kind of nice. A lot of the other sparrows will have some sort of speckling or a central dot. So these guys have this unmarked gray breast. And then the lack of a distinguishing feature is what I tell my technicians is the dis dis uh, is the distinguishing feature. So, like I said, just your classic little brown job uh, without really much of a, a field mark. The song is really distinct for these guys. It also can carry a long, long way in the sagebrush. I've probably heard them up to maybe 350 meters away. Um, it starts with a series of introductory descending notes. And then it's followed by a long and some very long uh, kind of buzzy trills that also sort of tend to decline in pitch as they go along. And I would say that those vocalizations in this recording tend to be on the uh, much shorter side. I, I feel like I've heard some individuals that have a continuous song for maybe 30 seconds or more. Um, so it can be very, very long. Another sparrow found in the sagebrush shrublands is the Vesper sparrow, and this is another migratory species. They utilize a wide variety of habitats. They can be uh, found pretty high up in elevation. You can basically find them in straight grasslands all the way up to, you know, juniper uh, woodlands and kind of everything in between. But um, that definitely incorporates or and includes sagebrush shrublands. The population status for the species is also thought to be declining throughout the range. They are a rather large, chunky sparrow. They have a large bill. They have this complete white eye ring. It's an entire eye ring here. And they have uh, the outer feathers in the tail are completely white, so you can see kind of basically the, the edge of this, the side edges of the tail are, are bordered in white. Um, they also have rusty patches in the wings that are sometimes visible. You can kind of see it here peeking out. Sometimes they're rather covered up, so I would recommend that you don't rely too heavily on that as a field mark. They have a fair amount of streaking on the breast that kind of converges into a, a 
central blotch in the middle of the breast. And then they also have this sort of Nike swoosh uh, shape right here below the eye and kind of curls around a little bit. And the vocalization, I've heard somebody, I think one of my colleagues, says, they say here, here, there, there, and then after that the song kind of goes everywhere. Um, but they usually have three or four introductory notes that do kind of have that here, here, there, there uh, quality to them. And, and then after that the, the trill kind of tends to descend as well. Okay, one more sparrow is the, the lark sparrow, another migratory species that can utilize sagebrush habitats. Luckily, this species is a little bit more distinct than, say, the brewer sparrow. Uh, but you can find them in grasslands and sagebrush shrublands. Usually, they tend to have some scattered uh, shrubs and, and oftentimes even trees. I um, will see them, kind of a, a typical environment for them would be like what you would think of as like a typical city park with real open ground, um, not a lot of uh, understory cover, but then with you know, your occasional tree or shrub that can be taller. Um, the population status for the species is thought to be increasing as of recently. And the nice thing is they have this very distinct head pattern with the alternating rusty and white stripes in the head. They have a, a real plain grayish breast with a, a very neat, tidy, central black spot. And then they have um, white corners of the tail. And the tail in flight is like a perfect uh, fan that you would use to um, cool yourself down in the summertime. It's kind of very rounded tail um, for a, a, compared to most sparrows. And again, this is a, a rather large sparrow as well. And a colleague of mine likes to think that their song is something like a, like a kid's space gun um, where it would have like a photon and array setting and so it's kind of real repetitive but then uh, for three or four or five notes and then it'll switch to kind of a different ray or photon or laser setting um, see if you can hear that um, sometimes people cue in that they have some kind of farting noises in between as well We've got one more sparrow, and I think this is the last on our list. It's the sagebrush sparrow, so formerly known as the sage sparrow, and then they recently just split, um, I think as of like maybe two years ago. So now uh, this part of the California range has been split out to the bell sparrow, and then the rest of the sage sparrow range is now considered to be sagebrush sparrow. And so um, they like shrubland with evenly spaced shrubs, seems to be... Uh, they have a preference for larger sagebrush. Uh, they are definitely a sagebrush obligate. However, sometimes if you get into some of this uh, greasewood and saltbush uh, kind of alkali soils as well, um, they'll, they'll creep into that habitat. Um, they prefer a, a really sparse understory, and that's both um, been written about them and backed up by some of the habitat modeling relationships that we've done through our monitoring data. The population status for the species is thought to be possibly declining, and you can see that this is another species that's getting a lot of uh, attention from multiple agencies. So, um, kind of a pretty sparrow. They have this nice gray head. They've got a clean breast with a dark spot on it um, right in the middle, and then they have this entire white eye ring as well. And uh, one of my technicians from just this last summer said uh, that when he hears it, it reminds me him of his kids in the back seat that are saying, they're basically saying, oh dear me, I've got to go pee. And so I don't know if that helps you, then great. <laughs> but kind of a musical song. Real short, very repetitive.
the nice thing is, is uh, across songs, uh, it's almost always the same. And that's what I mean by repetitive. It's not repetitive within a song, but there's very little variation from individuals or even, you know, if an individual is singing for 10 minutes, every song phrase is pretty much exactly that. That kind of, what do you mean? I've got to go pee. And so with that, um, that concludes the list of species that we we're going to go through today. Uh, I want to acknowledge the folks that provided all the photos, some of which were off of Flickr. Um, a lot of them were from Bill Schmoker, uh, who is a great partner of the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And also the range maps from the slides were provided by the Audubon Society and or the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Laura. She was going to talk about some of the tools that you can use following this webinar. And then hopefully we'll have a little time for questions as well. Yeah, I just uh, want to remind you that we did record this webinar and we will be posting it to our website. So if you missed something or, um, yeah, if you missed something that Nick said and are interested in hearing it again, uh, you can get to our website to see that. Uh, we do have a pocket guide to sagebrush birds um, in hand. So if you're interested in that, you can actually just email me. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't put my email on the uh, slide, but it's Laura, L-A-U-R-A dot Quattrini, good luck spelling that, Q-U-A-T-T-R-I-N-I -I at birdconservancy.org. And then we also have in hand uh, Voices of Sagebrush Birds, uh, which was developed in conjunction with the Cornell of Lab of Ornithology. I should mention that we also developed the Pocket of Sagebrush Birds with PRBO, uh, Point Blue. And uh, we are in the midst of developing a manual on incorporating bird conservation into sagebrush management that should be coming out this spring. And also this spring, we will be having another webinar on a, a tool that we are developing, a decision support tool that uh, will further enhance management decisions uh, in the eastern por portion of the sagebrush range. Um, that will integrate uh, multi-species conservation while maximizing sustainable grazing. Um, and I will be sending out more information about that soon. Um, so I guess we'll close with uh, any questions. And I don't think it's possible for you to raise your hand uh, with this GoToMeeting. So if you do have a question, please put it in the chat box. I haven't seen any so far. Um, I guess one thing I do want to mention uh, that was brought to our attention, we, did, we forgot to update our presentation. Uh, we gave it a couple years ago. And since then, uh, the greater sage grouse has been determined to be not warranted under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and yes, we do recognize that the reason for that, or one of the reasons, is because of all of the great work that a lot of our land managers are doing on the landscape. Uh, there was just a question, Laura, about where can they get the... The manual. So, yeah, when that comes out, um, we will also, we'll be sending out a, a bunch of notifications um, that it will be available. And as I said, it will be coming out this spring. So, um, yeah, stay tuned for more details. We'll also be sure to put that on our Rocky Mountain Avian Data Center under the Publications tab. and So that would be another place to look in case somehow you... Have you escape the emails. Okay. Well, with that, uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, if you have any comments, please go ahead and get in touch with me.